342, only a sinner, hymn 342. Not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. Once I was foolish and sin ruled my heart, causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus hath found me, happy my case. I now am a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Tears unavailing, no merit had I. Mercy had saved me or else I would die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face. But now I'm a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows, loving his Savior to tell what he knows. Once more to tell it, would I embrace? I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Praise the Lord for His love for sinners. Amen. If He didn't love sinners, He wouldn't have loved us. And wouldn't have reached us. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll be continuing our series on light in the Lord. And make a little bit of a transition here today from what we've talked about the last few weeks. But Ephesians chapter 2, we'll find ourselves in verse 1. I tell you, I appreciated this, this morning's Sunday school lesson. And I know our Brother Dan was hustling, man. He was trying to get done before the time was up. Um, had a lot to cover this last bit. Um, and it was a blessing uh, to see it. Um, but I want to read something to you here uh, that kind of goes in with what he talked about this morning, if I can. Um, because he mentioned something about, you know, God had convicted him about being real flippant with, not meaningfully flippant, but kind of inadvertently flippant with the presentation of the gospel. You know, he'd give a gospel track and say, here, here's your free ticket to heaven. And, uh, man, that, uh, that sounds catchy, right? It sounds trendy, maybe to say something like that, but it can be misused and misunderstood very easily. And um, really, it's been one of the great devastations of our time uh, that people have kind of made the gospel so um, insignificant and based around human need. For example, Paris Reed had made this comment in one of his messages. He said this, Well, now the philosophy of the atmosphere is humanism. The chief end of being is the happiness of man. And much of the world believes that today, that the reason you live is to be happy. There's another group of people that have taken umbrage with the liberals, this group of my people, the fundamentalists. And they say, we believe in the inspiration of the Bible. We believe in the de deity of Jesus Christ. We believe in hell. We believe in heaven. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But remember, the atmosphere is that of humanism. And humanism says the chief end of being is the happiness of man. Humanism is like a miasma out of a pit. It just permeates every place. Humanism is like an infection, an epidemic, and it just goes everywhere. So it wasn't long until we had this. The fundamentalists knew each other because they said, we believe these things. They were men, for the most part, that had met God. But you, had, but you see, it wasn't long until, they had, until, having said, these are the things that establish us as fundamentalists. The second generation said, this is how we become a fundamentalist. Believe in the inspiration of the Bible. Believe in the deity of Christ. Believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And thereby become a fundamentalist. And so it wasn't long until it got to our generation, where the whole plan of salvation was to give an intellectual assent to a few statements of doctrine, and I would even add standards, 
And a person was considered a Christian because he could say, "Uh uh-huh, at four or five places when they asked him. If he knew where to say, "Uh uh-huh, someone would pat him on the back, shake his hand, smile broadly, and say, brother, you're saved. So it had gotten down to the place where salvation was nothing more than an ascent to a scheme or a formula. And the end of this was that salvation was the happiness of man because humanism had penetrated. If you were to analyze fundamentalism in contrast to liberalism of a hundred years ago as it developed, for I am not pinpointing it at a time, I would be, it would be like this. And key in here, the liberal says the end of religion is to make man happy while he's alive. And the fundamentalist says the end of religion is to make man happy when he dies. But again, the end of all the religion that was proclaimed was the happiness of man. And whereas the liberal says by social change and political order, we're going to do away with the slums. We're going to do away with alcoholism and dope addiction and poverty. We're going to make heaven on earth and make you happy while you're alive. We don't know anything about, uh, about, uh, about after that, but we want you to be happy while you're alive. This is why Joel Osteen writes your best life now. It's based in humanism. They went ahead to try and do it only to be brought to a terrifying shock at the First World War utterly staggered by the Second World War because they seem to be getting nowhere fast. And we see it accelerating to our day. This was written in the 1940s, by the way. What we see today, we see today as an acceleration toward World War III. And all the social landscapes and communism has done nothing but degrade human, human, humanity further. And then the fundamentalists along the same line are now tuning in along the same wavelength of humanism until we find it something like this. Accept Jesus, you can go to heaven. You don't want to go to that old, filthy, nasty, burning hell when there's a beautiful heaven up there. Now come to Jesus so you can go to heaven. And the appeal could be as much to selfishness as a couple of men sitting in a coffee shop deciding that they are going to rob a bank to get something for nothing. There's a way that you can give an invitation to sinners that sounds for all the world like a plot to take up a filling station proprietor Saturday night earnings without working for them. You see, it's so important that we understand that salvation is not a free ticket to heaven. And I appreciate him saying that statement. Because if we're going to reach people for Jesus, we have to understand why people must be saved. And that's what's led us to this, to our study today. If we're going to be light in the Lord, we first, as we've talked about a few weeks ago, must understand what it means to repent of our sin and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then from that, as a launching point, we are filled with His Spirit. And as we speak of today, we've been equipped with some tools to help us with edification. So we found your place in Ephesians chapter 2. If you wouldn't mind standing with me as we read the Word of God this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 will be in verse number 1. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Father, we come to you now and ask your blessing on the reading, preaching, and teaching of your word. God, I ask you to please help us to be mindful of the work that you long to do in our lives, to bring us closer to you, to make us more like your son, and to impact this world by your grace. Lord, we pray that you'd help us now as we tune our, tune our hearts and our, and our minds to your word. Help us to be hearers, and not just hearers, but doers of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we look in this portion of Scripture, examining what the word of God says about light in the Lord and how we are supplied to walk in the light. When God's word commands you to do something, God's grace is not going to find you're not going to find God's grace in short supply to enable you to accomplish that command God does not uh, it would be interesting wouldn't it if uh, if for example the Marines uh, deployed to a front line somewhere and they brought no supplies with them gave them no no munitions no no protection no no tools of warfare and then the commanding officer came and said I want you to charge that hill and take it 
Well, how cruel would that be to literally throw bodies at a hill with no tools to defend themselves or to use to take that hill? It would be it would be it would be a, a mis, it would be a, a, a real tragedy. It would and would it, it wouldn't be real leadership. And so when God gives us commands in His Word and says to walk in the light as He is in the light or to be holy as He is holy, understand He has afforded to us tools to be used at our disposal to enable us to be able to walk in the light and to shine that light elsewhere. If you look in verse number 1 through 3, you find that uh, as we move on from chapter 1 and the thoughts of chapter 1 where the Holy Spirit enlightens us to the hope of His calling and the riches of His glory and the exceeding greatness of His power, um, that thought moves us into chapter 2, verse 1, where it talks about the, a, a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done to redeem us and to quicken us, the word here is, to life again in Him. Uh, this morning, I hope you understand it, you, we are created in the likeness of God. The Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 1 that, that man is the only creation created with a likeness of God. Uh, animals uh, have a spirit, all right, and they have a, and they are body, they're body and spirit. You say, how do you know that? Because they, they do funny things, don't they? Uh, my, we have a, a, a dog, my mom and dad do, his name is uh, Hunter. He's an old crotchety dog now. I mean, he's probably a good 15 years old, and, and he's a dachshund, and they get achy in the joints. You know how it goes, real, you know, these long, uh, stretched out dogs, their hips go bad. And if you just go to pet him, he starts growling at you. Not because he's mad, because he's scared. When you start petting me, it starts to hurt a little bit. So you got to be gentle, right? And so he's a little, he's not as good with kids as he used to be and things of that nature. Uh, he's got a will. He has some things. You know, he, he wants to go outside and use the bathroom, but he also follows instinct given to him by God. He doesn't have a lot of self-awareness necessarily, like we do. Animals don't ponder eternity because they have no sense of it. They're not created for it. But we have a sense of eternity because we're created in a different fashion. Because we have something that animals don't have. We have a soul. We're not just body and spirit. We are also a soul. And that soul, apart from Christ, is dead in trespasses and sins. That soul is that part of us that communes with God. And this is why the Bible says that first death was when Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord or rejected His command and ate of that fruit out of disobedience. It says that, they, that God told them, In the day that you eat of the fruit, ye shall surely die. Now, what, they did not, what we, what we kind of mistake there is we say, Well, God didn't honor His word because they were still alive. You misunderstand what death is. It's separation. And the minute... The minute they ate of that fruit, it says their eyes were open. They realized they were naked. And they all of a sudden, uh, what, what's the next thing that God says to them? Where are you? Why? Because the communion of their soul with Almighty God had been severed. Because they died in their souls that day. Now they were left exposed. Now they were ashamed. Now they had a new sensation called guilt. They tried to hide themselves and make sparse clothing for themselves to cover their nakedness. They, they, they didn't know what to do with themselves. And, and God, by His grace, displayed a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do when He killed an innocent animal to cover their bodies with coats of skins. As a display of what it was going to take. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no remission of sins. And the reality is, when Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed the Lord, they had severed their souls from fellowship with God. They had died in their souls. And Jesus Christ is the only way to be brought from death unto life. And this is what he's saying in verse number 1. He's saying, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Now here's the thing. If your soul is dead and you cannot walk in communion with God, then what are you led by? You are led by your impulses. You are led by your flesh, your passions, your desires, your lusts. And, every, and your soul has no communion with God, so there's no barometer, there's no meter. All you have, according to Romans chapter 2, is, is the law of God written in your heart. To help you have a conscience at least, and that's a mercy of God to humanity to give us a conscience that at least has a taste of what God's law says. You go anywhere in the world and you'll find people that have a code of ethics that they follow. Why? Because they have the law of God written in their hearts. Now, there might be a, a few exceptions to the rule when it comes to their code of ethics as to what we call ethical, 
But that isn't because God didn't put it there. It's because they unlearned some of God's ethics over time. Why do people lie? Because they want to cover themselves. They lie because of pride. Why do they steal? Because of pride. Why do they, why, why do, they do the things they do? Because they have no sense of a walk with God. So much so that as mankind proceeded further from there, we get to where it comes to the days of Noah, where the Bible says of, the, of mankind that every man uh, did evil continually. And there was no thought of God in their minds. And that day is fast approaching again. Right now we have the light and salt of the church. And someday that church will be taken out of place. And it won't be a shining light like it used to be. Where we are a... We are, by the use of the Holy Spirit, by the way, not our own efforts, but by the Holy Spirit of God, we are a restraining force to outright and utter sinfulness in this world. At least we are, ought to be. And this is why this portion of Scripture is so important. Because the Apostle Paul's writing in verse 1 to say, yes, he has given you his spirit internally. There is some internal deconstruction and reconstruction that's to take place. And these things are important, but it can't just be internal. It must move to the external. We see in verses 1 through 3 an altered construction. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. All we just said is what is wrapped up in these two verses, or three, these three verses. He is literally saying, because we were dead in trespasses and sins, apart from Christ, our conversation, our lifestyle is wrapped up in the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we are by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And all as an impulse of following what? Verse 2, the spirit of disobedience, flowing from the wicked one. It's a terrible state. It's not where God wants us to be. This is why he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross to save you from your sin. You are a wretched sinner and so am I, apart from God. It's just the reality of it. If you're not comfortable with that statement, it's because pride is in your way. You say, well, I try to do right by people. I try to do the right thing. I try to be a good person. Okay, I get you. But your level, your, your judgment of what is good and right to other people is compared amongst people, not against God. And the Bible says when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're unwise. Why? Because what does Romans teach us? We have all sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. We miss the mark. Sin, is, it's the definition of sin. It is to miss the mark. Whenever we don't, when, when our lives are given to do things that fall anywhere short of the righteousness and holiness of God, it is sin because it falls short of God's expectation. This is why sometimes in my life I have to remind myself uh, why I do things and why I don't do things. Sometimes I don't do things because I wonder to myself, would Jesus do this? Now, it's kind of a trite, trendy staying in the 90s, right? What would Jesus do, all right? Some of y'all are too young remember this, but we used to have these bracelets that came out, WWJD, all right? I mean, y'all had one of them, all right? Well, that was, that was the thing, man. What would Jesus do? I had friends who had them up their arm, but they would swear like sailors. And I'm like, good night. I don't think Jesus would do that, okay? <laughs> but we have, what would Jesus do? WWJD. And the reality is, it's a good, it, it, although it got misused and misappropriated, it was a good thought. Because it would do us a, real, a world of good if we would stop for a minute and think, how would Jesus handle this situation? What would, what would, what would be a Bible way of thinking through this situation or what, what's about to be said? That's called using the fear of God to bring you to biblical wisdom. I've been talking about that on Wednesday nights and peeling back Proverbs. The application of biblical truth to help us walk in biblical wisdom. But apart from God, without salvation, you have no access to that. And 1 Corinthians teaches us the natural man, as we saw a couple weeks ago, receives not the things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness unto him. And so we need to be saved. There must be an altered construction. The natural inclinations of the world and its affections are away from God and apart from God. Hold your place here and go with me to the book of James. If you go toward the back of your Bible, you'll find yourself in, after Hebrews, you'll find James. Hebrews is one of the thicker epistles or letters of the New Testament. But right after Hebrews, you'll find James. And go to James 
chapter number 4. And in James chapter 4, hear what James writes. He says in verse number 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Man, that's some strong verbiage right there. Those are some strong words. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This is something that what would go from here. John the Apostle would write in his first epistle, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, are not of the Father, but are of the world. You see, these things, we, we cannot attach ourselves to these things. And Jesus knew this. This is what Jesus taught. You cannot be focused and living for that which is temporal and anchored to this world and its present system because it will by nature decay you. Go to Matthew chapter 6 with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves, Matthew 6, 19, treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then comes this parenthetical that almost seems disjointed if you're not properly looking at this verse of Scripture. Verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now mammon is a personification of money. Uh, it was a cultural reference from back then that they would worship money in a personification. It was mammon was a typical word for that, okay? But the point is this. Jesus just comes from saying, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth that is decayable, is stealable, is temporal, but live for the things of heaven, which is incorruptible and eternal. For example, Max, I'm going to use it for example this morning, okay? Max, how, what sounds better? $100 or $200? $200. $200 every time, right? Now, if I had a $100 bill on this wall, and I had a $100 bill on that wall, all right? And I'd say, Max, you can't have both. you got to have one or the other. In his mind, he's thinking, man, if I could just stretch real hard. I could just find some way to knock both of them off there. But the reality is they're too far apart. He can't reach that far, so he's got to make a choice. Where's he going, right? Now let's up the ante. Let's put $500 over here and a mystery box over there. Now he don't know what's in that mystery box, but he knows it's $500 over here. Now, $500, that's a fair amount of money, right? You pay a couple bills off that way and maybe take your wife out for a nice date. Amen. Miss Lexi said amen. All right. And uh, <laughs> five hundred dollars might be good. But what he doesn't know is there's fifteen hundred dollars under that mystery box. But he's got to make a choice. He's got to commit that from his seat he's got to go one way or the other. And if he tries to do both, he'll fail. Because you can't walk a straight line and go one direction or the other. You can't ride the fence. Jesus is using the illustration of somebody who's got kind of like a wall-eyed syndrome. Their eye is evil. It's sick. It's decayed. One eye is pointing this way and one eye is pointing this way, and I can't make it happen otherwise I would, okay, uh, because it's not natural. Uh, but but if, have you ever seen somebody whose eyes don't focus straight? They've got one eye this way, one eye this way. They have issues. They can't walk straight hard, hardly. They've got medical problems because of it, and they have to get treatments to help with it. And Jesus is saying, hey, it's one thing if your eye is evil and you can't do things physically, but if, if, if what is in you, if your whole body is full of darkness, 
so that you're, you have a divided mind serving God or serving mammon, how great is that darkness? Why? Because you are choosing one or the other. You can't choose both. And so Jesus proposes this morning, you will either live for the world or you will live for God, but you can't live for both. And the Holy Spirit, as we saw in Galatians chapter 5, lusts against the flesh. And the flesh lusts against the spirit. Boy, they are in contention one with another. Why? Because your spirit and your soul are in unison for the first time in forever. I mean, they, God has made you alive in your soul and now your spirit can be affected by your soul communion with God. And, and now you know the sweetness of God's joy and sweetness of God's presence. But oh, your spirit, sometimes it gets a little nudge from the flesh. And your body that is still broken and decrepit by sin reaches out and says, oh, but wouldn't that feel good? Oh, but wouldn't that be nice? Oh, wouldn't that, boy, wouldn't it feel good just to kind of stick it to that person? They hurt you, they didn't do right to you, but wouldn't it feel good to just give them a tongue lashing? Let them know what you really think about them. Wouldn't that feel good? Wouldn't it feel good to, to, to look at this or to do this or partake in this, whatever it might be, and your flesh lusts against your soul, your spirit, your spirit against the flesh, and there's this, con there's this conflict inside. And it says the conflict is so hard that if you don't deal with one or the other, it is so hard that you cannot do the things that you would. Because you know what's right. And we came to the conclusion a couple weeks ago, what? To him that knoweth to do good and who to doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. But here's the thing. God has given me a spirit internally to help work through that. So much so, the Bible says, if we live in the Spirit, we shall also walk by the Spirit. You say, what is that talking about? What that means is, you might have, your soul is brought alive by the Spirit of God, but you have to make a choice to walk in the Spirit. You've got to pick one or the other. Where are you going to invest your energies? Where are you going to invest your passions? Where are you going to invest your time? And here's the thing. The world system is going to challenge your faith in God. That's what Jesus says. Look here in verse number 24. No man can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet put uh, uh, your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Now church, that's a question that, that begs for us to think biblically. We already visited a portion of Scripture, and I won't go there for time's sake, but what does Corinthians teach us? The body is not for fornication, but, the, but the, for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So, and, and what else does the Bible teach us? That our, our body is the what? The temple of God. And so we don't live in this temporal life to serve the temporal. We ought to live to serve the eternal. But here's what trips us up, verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? What is he saying here? He's saying that the world, and a focus on the things of this world, will call to question our faith and the love of God. It will call to question our faith in the love of God. Look in verse 26 again. What is he saying? What? He's saying the fowls of the air, the birds. God takes care of the birds. And on the rank and the hierarchy of creation, we're better than them. God loves you more than sparrows, and he takes care of them, doesn't he? But the reason we struggle with whether God can provide or not is because we question if God is good or not. And if God loves us or not. The reason we don't honor God in the tithe is because we doubt God's love and goodness. Well, God, if you love me, you wouldn't make me give you 10%. What? Really? That's, that's like Dawson coming to me and saying, Dad, if you love me, you let me eat all the cookies I want to. Really? I don't know about that. You better share one of the cookies with me, and then we're in good shape. Amen? No. <laughs> no. That's not, what God, that's not what God's saying. Because God doesn't want the 10% because He needs it. 
He's saying, look, I, I, I demand, I expect the 10% as a minimum. Why? Because it shows that you defer all of your reliance for things and provision on me. And when you choose to defer your things and provisions to me, then I, as Brother Dan mentioned this morning in the Sunday school hour, I will return it to you pressed down in good measure and your cup will run over. I'll make sure that you have what you need when you need it. So that when trouble comes up and it seems like the bank account's getting thin and the bills are getting thick, God has a provision waiting for you because you honored him first above yourself. But you can't honor God with the physical things if you don't think that God actually loves you and wants to take care of you. You'll doubt his goodness and the world wants you to doubt his goodness because the whole world is wrapped up in trying to take care of yourself. If I hear one more commercial on emergency food supply, I'm going to shoot myself in the head. <laughs> Why? Because it's ridiculous. They, they want you to say, hey, you should just hoard up all this food and hoard up all this food. And I'm, am I against being prepared? I'm not against being prepared. Don't get me wrong. But I'm simply saying, uh, God knows how to take care of his people. You've got to put more faith and stock in God's ability to take care of you than putting your, than your, putting your family on out because you're spending all your money on preparatory food supplies. Well, it's only $1,000 for 45 days of supply of food. How foolish. Go to the commissary, buy you some pork and beans for $1.50 and put it in your cabinet. Them cans of beans will last for two years. You don't need some fancy prepackaged MRE from a Patriot Food Supply. And if God thought you needed it, guess what? You'd get it. Just trust God. You say, Pastor Knight, do you ever worry about you know, your family and taking care of your family? Absolutely. I'd be lying to you if I, if I didn't tell you that there were days I think, man, what if North Korea got crazy over here and dropped a bomb over here? Oh, we do. When you, when, you're a, when, you're, when you take care of a family, you think about those things, right? To prepare for some stuff. But at the end of the day, you can't prepare for everything. And that's what Jesus says. Look in verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You can't even make yourself taller. Some of you said, man, I wish I could, amen. <laughs> if I, 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 sometimes I pray to God, give me one, just one and a half more inches. Let me say six foot. I want to put six foot on that ID card. <laughs> God didn't give it to me, amen. He put me just shy of it, all right. If I, if I stretch real good, I'm 5'11", all right. Uh, <laughs> Adding one thought, to, I can't add one cubit. I can't add nothing to my stature. Why? Because it's not in my power to do those things. I can't control myself in my growth or provision physically, but the birds don't care about that stuff. Why? Because they get what they need when they need it. You don't see birds out here falling out of the sky because they're starving. God takes care of them, and God will take care of you. You can trust the Lord. But you have to trust him first. Then verse 28. Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after the, all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He says, now he says here, not just that, that the world and the cares of this life will cause you to question our faith in the love of God, but it will also to cast, cast a, a, a doubtful eye on the power of God. You ever thought about how stuff grows? You realize that, stu that germination has to take place. You, you know what germination is, don't you? It's decay. The seed has to die and begin to decompose. And by the creative miracle of God, when that happens, life is born from that which is dying. Scientists can, can write all the formulas out, but at the, end of day, at the end of the day, if you really think about the miracle of birth and growth, it is literally a miracle that anything grows in this world. It's a miracle. It's the goodness of God. It's the power of God. And if God can take a kernel of corn or a kernel of wheat that is sown into the ground and it die in the ground and yet still grow life from it tenfold, 
then surely God can take care of you and clothe you and provide for you. This is why people have hoarding problems. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands tonight, this morning. Anybody have, a, anybody have a hoarding problem? No, don't, don't raise your hand, okay. The reason we have hoarding problems is because we doubt the goodness and the, the power of God to provide. Can God take care of me? Oh, here, let's go a step further. Is what God's going to give me as good as I would like it to be? Because we don't just trust the power of we don't just distrust the power of God to provide, but we trust the goodness of, of God to provide that which is good for us. Well, if I trust God for a car, He's going to give me some kind of broken down, you know, a Pinto or something. Really? You don't think God knows you have a need to drive to work? You don't think He's going to afford you opportunities and abilities to be able to get to work? And if he thinks you need a car, that he can't provide you a car that's good enough to get you from point A to point B in good manner? It might not be a Ferrari, but you don't need a Ferrari. You say, yeah, I do. No, the speed limit only goes to 100 kilometers per hour on the, on the, on the freeway. And, and, and on the Ferrari, what? It goes right here. All the rest of that's just excess, all right? It's going to get you in trouble, all right? God can provide for you. And he can provide good things for his people. Is that to say we should walk around in potato sacks and, and, and mourning all the time? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is God knows how to take care of his people. And you follow the impulse of his spirit and let his spirit mold and break and shape your desires. The desires that are in your heart will begin to fall in formation as we talked about last week with his desires. And you'll begin to see your prayers answered. Why? Because he says if you ask anything in my name or according to my will, I will answer it. This isn't name it and claim it Christianity. Well, God, I declare that you're going to give me $50,000 next week. That's foolishness. That's wickedness. Because you're trying to put God as your genie in the bottle. He's not your genie, and you're not in control of God. But what do we do? We submit our desires. We submit our minds to Him. He begins to shape and mold so that when we bow our heads, we say, Oh God, would you save so and so? Oh God, would you provide for our building program? Oh God, would you help me give more for missions this year? Oh God, would you help me? I got, I want to do more for you, and I believe you can help me do more for you. And before you know it, God begins to put thoughts in your minds on what you can do to get, to get there. Because your desires are now aligned with His desires, and you're in the channel of blessing. It's not some magic recipe. It's just simply being willing to submit our expectations to God's will and letting him live through us. But see, we don't do that because we don't trust that what God has for us is good. Well, if I, I, I'd surrender to be a missionary, but I know God's going to put me in, the, in, in Antarctica. Number one, I don't think penguins need to be saved, amen. Um, <laughs> but number two, don't you think that God knows where, he, where, where, where he's equipped you to reach people. And if he calls you to a country outside of your comfort zone that he can't help you and grow you and teach you how to reach those people, absolutely. We're going to talk about Esther tonight some more. And we're going to look at her natural preparation, how God created her for the purpose she fulfilled in that moment. Physically prepared her. We pretend like God's will always has to do with the mental, spiritual side of things. It doesn't always, it's not always that way. Even Jesus, when he came to this world, he was not an attractive person. The Bible says quite, quite honestly that, he was, that there was nothing about Jesus that made him physically attractive in any way, shape, or form. That he should be desired. It was just, he was just a normal guy that just, he didn't, he didn't stick out of a crowd. It wasn't like when Jesus walked through a crowd, the heavens parted and he glowed. It wasn't anything like that. If you weren't looking for him, you probably would have missed him. And yet we think sometimes that, that it takes some kind of supernatural spiritual strength. Sometimes it's just what God has given you as tools. And here's the, th here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the tie. Because what we're going to talk about the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the gift and tools that God has given us externally to help us live the Christian life. Go back to Ephesians with me, if you will, chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and you look in verse number 6. 
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So how do you walk in the light? You walk in good works. What are good works? Godly works, holy works, righteous works, Holy Spirit driven works. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in flesh made by hands, but at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who, were, who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What is he saying here? He's saying that as Gentiles, as those that are not Jews that receive the commandments of God, we were apart from God with no real system to get back to God. I mean, God did afford for Gentiles to become part of the nation of Israel, but they had to go through a pretty strenuous process for that. And to be quite honest, the Jews didn't handle that well. They became very racist against a lot of their persecutors. And they would push them away. And this is why in the New Testament, God gave sign gifts, for example, like the temporal gift of speaking in tongues. Why? Why? to prove to the, to the Jewish nation that the Gentiles could be saved as well. It all, the last real mention of tongues that happens is the one that culminates with Cornelius' household. Cornelius was a Gentile. There was no drop of Jewish blood in him. And yet Cornelius wanted to know God. And God said, find Peter. And Peter just so happened to be at Simon the Tanner's house on the top of his house, praying. And all of a sudden, he entered into a vision he never had before. This great picnic. And there was all kind of unclean meats there. And God said, arise, kill and eat. And he said, whoa, not so, Lord. You'd think Peter would have learned by then not to tell God no, okay? But there he goes anyway, telling God no. God, not, uh, my lips have never touched unclean meat. Oh, how pious of you, Peter. And God says what? That which I've called clean, call not thou unclean. Now, Peter's scratching his head. What on earth was that? Is God saying I can go out and eat pork steak now? Is that what this is we're talking about here? And all of a sudden, a ring comes up. Hey, hey, Simon. Yeah, what's going on, Simon? Simon, Simon, all right. <laughs> what's going on, Simon? Uh, there's a guy from a guy named Cornelius' house, and he said that God told him to come talk to you. Peter gets there. He preaches a message. Cornelius' household receives the message of the gospel. And it says that and when they heard the word, they believed what Peter was saying that the Holy Spirit fell on them and they began to speak in other tongues. And Peter said what? Of a truth I perceive. You see, God had given the gift of tongues for that temporary time and the gift of prophecy for a short time. Why? To help people that were Jews who needed to see a sign because they were a stubborn, adulterous generation to see that the same God that worked in them was the same God that worked in the Gentiles. Once God wedded that reality together, that it, this, this, this church mystery was not about the Jews, but about the whole world, those sign gifts began to echo off. Why? Because now we had the completed canon of Scripture. We had the basis of the foundation set from the apostles. And that's what the Scriptures tell us right here. Look there in Ephesians chapter 2. Go, you know, scroll, scroll down a little bit in verse 20. Or verse number 19. I'm going to bump up again. I'm sorry. Verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access, here it is, by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom, also, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I'll introduce it this way before we go for next week. But what Ephesians is beginning to tell us here, and what Paul is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is that yes, it is crucial that we walk in the Spirit if we are going to walk in the light. 
if we are going to walk in, in good works. We must be saved. We must have the Spirit of God helping us discern internally. But you will not grow further until you plug yourself in corporately. You need the church. You need it. God has not ever intended. What did God say about Adam? It is not good for man to be alone. What does it say here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You couldn't save yourself, and you can't sanctify yourself. And so God's Word says we need the church to perform something in the sanctification process called edification. Edification. It is crucial. The necessary, when it comes to our this altered construction, a new construction by edification, we must understand that there must be an altered construction of faith. There must be a walk in God that's authentic. But we must also must embrace an altered cohabitation. And that is that we now don't walk in our own desires and our own minds and by our own ways. We walk by the Spirit of God with God's people. In Colossians chapter 3 you look there for just one moment we're going to close here in just a moment and look at the flow of this in comparison to what we've just mentioned the last 30 minutes or so Verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Does it sound familiar? That's Matthew 6 coming out again. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon earth, fornication and cleanness and ordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. Now you notice in these verses from verses 5 through verse number 10 that he's talking about the sanctification process of putting things off and putting things on. We'll talk more about that in the future. I'm going to pocket that for now. But go to verse 12 with me and look at this transition. Because that's all the internal work of the Holy Spirit to bring about sanctification. That's all personal responsibility. But now look at verse 12 and the transition that takes place here. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. These are all interpersonal gifts of the Spirit and operations of the Spirit. You can't be these if you're not with people. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Well, I don't go to church because church is full of hypocrites. Well, then so are you. It's not right. I'm not excusing it. Some of the most wicked people in this world live in churches because the devil is not immune to the church doors. But that doesn't mean you don't go to church. Doesn't mean you don't gather with God's people. Because God didn't push you out when you were undesirable. We shouldn't push others away when they seem undesirable. Verse 14, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now here it is. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, grace, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You see, you cannot disjoint if you are going to grow in this life with the Lord and your walk with Him. You cannot take away the church from that process. Now, we'll, we're going to break down some of the theology of this in the coming weeks because we can't just do, this can't just be a one-week thing. The church is so much more important than that. But you better believe if Jesus Christ died 
to redeem us from our sins and institute the church by his resurrection? And if he's going to command us to gather, if he's going to give us instructions for how to operate, if he's going to help us to know that we need to edify one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and the word of God, then you best believe we better make it a priority in our lives. We need church. We need to be a part of a local church. Not church bouncers. We're not made of rubber. We shouldn't be bouncing down the road, okay? When God places you in a church, he places you there to stick and be a part of that local assembly. And you should join a church. If you want to know how to join this church, just ask me. We'll make you, jump on, make you do ten jumping jacks, walk up and down the aisle five times, and repeat your name backwards. I'm just joking, okay? It's nothing like that. All we'll do is give, us, give you a statement of faith that you read through and see what our doctrine is. And if you can agree with that and assent to that doctrine, and if you're saved and baptized in a like-minded church, we'll welcome you in with open arms. And we'll get you plugged in as best we can as God leads. But it's God's will that you be a part, functioning and fruitful of a local church. Let's stay with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we come to you. Oh God, we thank you so much again for today. Thank you for the chance to be in this place, to meet with, uh, with you and your word by your spirit. Lord, I pray that you help us to meditate on these truths we've learned from your word today as we go our separate ways. Lord, we pray that you bring us back together tonight as we continue to worship you and give you this day to honor you and to prioritize you in our week. We pray, God, you help us uh, with all that will take place today, whether it be the, just the conversations we have or the business meeting tonight, that all will be done to your honor and glory, and that you'd be uh, lifted up in our lives and in our church so that all men can turn unto you. We thank you, God, for your goodness now. We commit these things to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you back tonight, 6 o'clock. God bless you.